Someone's car is angry out there, I tell you what. Do what? A Ford? On this side. <laughs> All right. A lady shared a story that she grew up in the country and the family required on chickens. Many of you have chickens. They required on the chickens for eggs uh, for breakfast in the morning to cook with throughout the week and to make deviled eggs for Sunday supper among many things, for pies, for cakes. And it was a way of life. It was a necessity. We still need chickens to this day. And, but back then, in the day, everyone had chickens and they had the chicken house. Well, one night, the lady shared that a fox got into her aunt's chicken house and killed all 12 chickens. Well, this lady's mother knew that she had to do something. She could not fix the whole problem, but she did not let that, the, the, the problem overwhelm her. She said, you know, I can't get 12 chickens, but I can go from house to house and ask for one chicken. And that's what she did. And she replaced all 12 chickens. She did not let the problem overwhelm her. She persevered in the face of a very difficult situation. And one by one, house by house, they got the chickens. And she handled the problem because truly she persevered. The question I want to ask you this morning is perseverance for the cause of Jesus Christ. Is it worth the cost? If you have your copy of God's Word, take it, open it to Acts chapter 14. We're going to be in verses 21 through 28 this morning. Hear now the Word of the Lord. After they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of heaven. Shall I say the kingdom of God is what my version says. When they had appointed elders from, for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they committed them to the Lord to whom they had believed. They passed through Pisidia and they came into Pamphylia. When they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Attila. From there they sailed to Antioch, from which they had been committed to the grace of God for the work that they had accomplished. When they arrived, they gathered the church together. They began to report all things that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they spent a long time with the disciples. This is the word of God for those of us who say we are the people of God. As we left our guys off last week, our guy Paul had been stoned by the crowd. He had been left for dead. Those who were with him, they stood around him. They didn't run in protection to protect their own hides. They stood firm. They stood firm because they were wearing the full armor of God. They knew the Holy Spirit had sent them. They knew the Holy Spirit would protect them. They did not tuck tail. They did not run. They were on the run. They were singing, I know all is well, but they knew God is in control. Satan was on their tail, but they could sing, all is well. When the Holy Spirit sends you, you can sing all is well 100% of the time. Amen. No matter how hard it is in the face of great adversity, when you've lost 12 chickens, you can say all is well because God is your provider, not man. Amen? Amen. That's how they could sing all is well. The Holy Spirit was using them 
to blaze a trail for the gospel of Christ. Our guy got up the next day because of their calling and their faith and their perseverance, and they went to the next town to be a witness of the grace of Christ in their lives. Check me out. I just got stoned to death, but I'm here the next morning. I'd still be laid up in the bed going, somebody bring me something to drink. I'm, I'm tired and I'm parched. <coughs> Not our guys. They knew what their calling was to go and be a witness to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the utter, to the remotest part of the world, and they did not stop. They go on to the next town to be a witness of the grace of Christ in their lives. The question today truly is this, is perseverance for the cross of Christ worth it? If you have your copy of God's Word, if you've not opened it there, get over to Acts chapter 14. We will be in the 21st to the 28th verses. If you do not own a Bible, there is one in the P-Rack in front of you. Take it, write your name in it. That's going to be our gift to you this morning. And as we literally look at the gospel this morning, as we look at what's going on, we have seen, as we looked last week, they saw delusion. They saw division. Now we're going to see the declaration of the gospel because of their perseverance. Because of their perseverance, number one, they got to preach the gospel and they taught many. Look at verse 21. Acts 14, verse 21. After they had preached the gospel, and just go back. Look, look at verses, um, uh, where is it? Look at verses 19 and 20. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and he entered the city. The next day he went away with Barnabas for Derby. He kept going. He persevered. And because of that perseverance, they got to continue to preach the gospel of Christ, and they taught many. Verse 21 says, after they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. They got invited back to a place where they previously had been rejected. They made a difference because they stood firm. Their feet were shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace they had on the helmet of salvation. They had the breastplate of righteousness and they took the sword of the Spirit into battle. They took the Word of God and they mobilized it for the first time. They did not give up. They persevered. They were traveling about 18 to 20 miles uh, on foot in one direction. And you just don't, you know, look, they don't just run into Waco, hand out a couple of Bibles and get back by 4 o'clock. They didn't do that. And get home and sit on the couch and watch reruns of Golden Girls. That's what I'd be doing, okay? Because I love me some Golden Girls. I love Matlock, Murder, She Wrote. That's free. I'm not going to charge you extra for that. But literally, they didn't do that. They, they left. They say, we got to get on to the next town. And the Holy Spirit says, you got to go back here. Something is happening. You have made a difference. You got to go. And I'd be going, why are we going back? Why are we backtracking? And in that time period, something took. They, they get stoned to death, left for dead. They go on down the next road, and the Holy Spirit says, oh, you got to go back. Say, what? I ain't going back there. Those people don't like me. But something took a, a seed of the grace of Christ, the saving grace of Christ, a seed was planted in some hearts in that area. Amen. And they said, we got to go back. It is a moral imperative that we go back. We cannot give up. They have now returned to see the fruits of their labors. Church, it will not always be that way. You will plant seeds that you never see them grow. You never see them nurtured. But you may be the only Jesus others may see. Our job is to go and be a witness. 
Wherever we go, we will be a witness for the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. That is what we are to do. And they're, they're, they get to see the fruits of their labors. The farming process takes time. I got my farmers out here. So, um, we got corn growing right now. Right? I think. All right, so for all my... You can just say yes to everything. I love you. He's my amen guy. But here's my question to all you farmers. What day every year do you plant the corn? Come on now. I know y'all are farmers. It's like a cycle. Every year you do it on the same day. Before March 15th? Before March 15th? Why not on March 15th? Oh my gosh. But what I'm saying is you can't bank that on every year, on March 15th, every farmer's out there planting corn. Why? Because of the weather. It takes time. So you get the seed planted. And then you just, you have to stare at it. But to get that field ready, you've got to plant. You, you, you've got to turn the soil. You've got to go deep to get the good soil to come up to the top. That takes time. You just don't plant a seed every year. You've got to turn the dirt and get your hands dirty. From there, you get the planting done. From there, you water it. You fertilize it. You take care of it. You nurture it. You spend time with it. And then at some point, you're going to see it sprout up through the ground. What I want you to see, the discipleship process is not a one and done deal. You got to keep going back and back and back. We're going to start going out to the coffee shops, five different areas. By the way, what are we on there? We still good to go with that? We're still good. We're, we just haven't heard any back from that. Right, I don't care if we don't get the grant thing. We're still doing this. Yes. All right, good. Start in June. We need help. We need y'all to sign up. We are going to the coffee shops to meet our neighbors. All right? We're going to have coffee with them. I don't care if you have to go back 500 times to, to let them plant a seed of Jesus in their heart. We're going to love them. We're going to love people when it hurts. We're going to love them even more. I could not go back. If y'all tried to stone me, I'm not sure you'd ever see me again. But they go on back. We're back. Go Jesus. Ugh, I'm not sure about this Jesus fellow. But they, they are. They are sold out for the cause of Christ. And it takes time. Friends, your words make a difference everywhere you go and in the lives and the hearts of everyone you come in contact with. Your story matters. Amen. You have a story of the grace of Christ and how it has transformed your lives and your hearts. We all have that story. I got a call this past week from one who said, you know, digs over morning coffee. I watched Jonathan's testimony. And they said, I sat there and I wept as I listened to how God has worked in his life. That's it. We all, every single person here has a story of how Christ has transformed your life. What are y'all doing to that baby? Oh, well, make her happy again. You love her. Literally, we have a story. They could hear and see the impact of what Christ had done. Our, our guys, they're hearing these stories of people. They're hearing that, oh, they heard what we said, so they go back. They still have Satan on their trail, but they're still singing all is well as they head back into enemy territory. They never gave up because they persevered. Number next, because of their perseverance, they strengthened those around them in Christ and they encourage them. Look at verse 22. Acts 14 verse 22. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Church, the seed is taking hold in a few. And it's beginning to grow within their hearts. And they're saying, there is something to this fellow named Jesus. 
We are experiencing love and grace perhaps for the first time ever. There's something to these guys. We need to sit down and listen. Here's a question. Every one of you should have someone that pours into you on a regular basis. One of my goals for all of us is for all of us to be involved in a small group where we are poured into. I don't care where that is, but on this hilltop, my prayer is that we would have a group that pours into us. Who pours into you? Because the one thing I know, we can't do life when we're empty. We must be doing life with one another. So they're starting, they're, that seed got planted and they're starting to fertilize it and, and they're starting to water, they're starting to weed a little and they're like, okay, you want to go deeper in your relationship with Christ and with God. We're going to walk with you and we are not going to stop. We are never going to leave you or forsake you. You need us. When people join this church, one of the things I say in one form or fashion, this is now your tribe you need somebody, you can call anybody in this church if you need something. Because it, in, in the Acts 2 church, they did all things together. They did life together. They took bread, they prayed, they fasted. If, if you had a need, they sold stuff. Here you go, here's the money. We got you covered. Community is what we are building here on this hilltop. A community of believers who say, we love you no matter what. And we are here for you. So they are strengthening. And we're going to be encouragers to one another. Our words matter. I am so big, big on words of how we treat one another. How we speak to one another. And it must be encouraging and edifying. It must honor and it must glorify Christ. Amen. Number next, they organize churches. Look at verse 22 to, um, no, 23 to 25. When they had appointed elders from for them in every church, having prayed with fasting. Stop. What did they do? They, they, they did what first? Pray. And then next? Prayer and fasting. They go back to, if you go back to Acts chapter 1, 8, what did, the whole, what did Jesus tell them to do? He said, wait. And you don't do one thing until the Holy Spirit moves. They prayed and they fasted over those whom they would appoint as elders. And they had passed through. Now, yeah, I'm on 23. That's it. They commended those to whom the Lord who they had believed. These are the first churches that are starting to be formed in that area. They, they, they knew they needed a place for the people to gather and really get poured into so, so that they could pour out. We come here every Sunday. We come here Wednesdays. We come to Sunday school. We've got our small groups. What do you think all the leaders are doing? What do you think I'm doing here on Sunday morning? I'm pouring into you. All of y'all are being poured into by the leadership of this church. Why? So, so that you can leave this hilltop and go pour out what has been poured into you. And I pray it is the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. They knew that they needed that. They came to hear the sword of the Spirit pierce their, and let that pierce their hearts and hear a word from the Holy Spirit. That's why they came to these churches. They had never experienced this before. They expected God to speak directly to them. They showed up, prayed up. Lord, do a work in me this day. Speak to me. Do we expect to God to speak to us? Do we expect God to do a work in us when we come to this hilltop? Hallelujah. I pray so. They did not come. They came not for the entertainment of worship, but to hear a word from the Holy Spirit. I truly pray that you come here expecting to hear a word from the Holy Spirit and not digs. I will disappoint you 52 Sundays a year. If you come looking for me, you're going to be, you're going to be angry. But if you come expecting to hear from the Holy Spirit, your heart will be overflowing whenever you leave here. Number next, they, they shared a witness of what they had done. Look down to verses 26 to 28. From there, it says, they sailed to Antioch, from which they had been commended to the grace of God. 
for the work that they had accomplished. When they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report all things that God had done with them and, and how he opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And it says they spent a long time there with the disciples. They went back to where they began. They went back to their home church, if you will, to uh, the, the very group that had sent them out. They were accountable to a body of people. Y'all not going to like this. We're accountable to one another. Some of y'all don't want to hear that this morning. We are accountable to one another. We are accountable to God. We are accountable to the Holy Spirit. All in the name of Jesus Christ. For how we handle this word. How we treat one another. How we speak. How we live out our lives. John Wesley wanted us to live holy lives. Scriptural holiness is what he called it. That was his desire. There were expectations. They prayed. They fasted. And they go, so we sent you. So they get back and like, all right, how'd it go? They gave a testimony of their witness, of their fruits, of their hardships, and the things that they perhaps should have done differently. It is in this space that iron sharpens iron. Amen. There will be moments we have to have the hard conversations. Do it in love when you do that with a brother or a sister. Love them because Jesus loves you no matter what. Friends, if they were able to give a word and report back because they did not tuck tail back when Paul got stoned. They did not tuck tail in the face of adversity because of the protection of the Holy Spirit. They truly sang all is well all the way back home with joy and with gladness in their hearts. They persevered. Is it worth the cost? Charles Simeon, a preacher, 1700s. At 19 years of age, and no one, not one of y'all has suffered like this person. At 19 years of age, he went to Cambridge, and he went through his studies, excelled. His parents were aloof. One had passed, and then one, grieving, just had basically very little time for him. And so we had been at Cambridge just a few days and one of the head guys comes and says, oh, by the way, I want you to take communion. He's like, say what? He said, yeah, all the students are doing it. He's like, well, I, I've never done that. Don't know about it. So we got all these books. He read, he prayed, he repented. And he took communion. Didn't change. That was in December, I think, of 1792. By Easter, he had given his life to Jesus Christ. At that table, I believe the Holy Spirit did a work in his life. And so the bishop says, well, I want to send you to, to a church. And he said, yeah, I'm not sure about that. He said, just go and preach a few times. Start showing up. And so he does. And there was a, a, a preacher who was retiring in. They kept calling upon the former preacher who was supposed to be leaving. He would give, they called them afternoon lectures. But he wouldn't leave. And so our guy Simeon goes to the, back to the bishop and says, look, they don't want me. You ever felt not wanted? But you know God has called you to do a task. And he says, you still got to show up. And the bishop said, look, if you don't go, fine. But I'm not sending the guy that's currently there. You are the guy. And if not, I'll send someone else. So he goes. And he just starts showing up. And literally, they, they were mean to him for the first 12 years. When he would try to go visit, they would lock their doors and hide. He could see them through the windows. When he would try to preach, they would lock their pews when... He bought uh, uh, other pews and he bought uh, benches and, and chairs. They locked the church and threw all that out in the front of the church yard and burned it up. After he was there 30 years, things got better, but then the church turned again for another 12 years. 
but he persevered because he loved them like Jesus would. That is how we are to love one another. You know how long he was there at that church? 54 years. He persevered. He never gave up. He did not tuck tail and run because he knew he was cold. Churches, literally, I believe God is using this hilltop in this corner of his kingdom to do a work through the people called Methodist. Billy Graham once said that if revival is to occur, and I'm telling you, Amy Diggs and I prayed on the evening of April the 9th when we left this hilltop after meeting y'all for the first time. My wife is so much more spiritual and holy than I ever will be. She goes, well, he need to pray. You're the preacher. I said, I'm not the preacher yet. You pray. <laughs> oh, fine. Bow, but don't close your eyes. I was driving. She prayed for revival on this hilltop. In church on this Pentecost Sunday, I submit to you that flaming tongues of fire are still burning hot on this hilltop. Revival is happening and the embers are spreading throughout our corner of God's kingdom. Billy Graham said, if revival is to happen, it will be through the people called Methodists. They had the right doctrine, if only they would preach it. It's happened through them before if they would only remember it. We must never stop going. Is perseverance worth the cost? Our answer is smack dab in the middle of the text. Listen to verse 22 again. And stand, and this will be our benediction. Strengthening the souls of the disciples... Encouraging them to continue in the faith through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Is it worth the cost? Our friend Paul said this when he spoke to the church, the second letter to his church at Corinth, and he said this, Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And here's the response he got. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, he said, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell, may abide in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties. And here's why we persevere, church, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I pray so, church, in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, all God's children said,